Chapter 20 of 2,000 Miles Below by Charles Willard Diffin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Taloned Hands. Simple pastoral folk, the people of the light. In their inner world, a vanishing world, where nearly all of what once had been a vast country was now covered by the steadily encroaching sea. They had resisted the degeneration which might easily have followed the destruction of a complex civilization. Living simply and clean of mind, they had clung to the culture of the past as it was taught them by their wise ones, and now the people of the light had found a new god. Not that Dean Rawson had asked for that exalted position. On the contrary, he had tried his best to make them understand that he was only one of many millions, some better, some worse, but all of them merely humans. His speaking the language of the Holy Mountain had convinced them first, but when old Rotan, oldest and grayest of the mountain's servants, went into a trance, then Rawson could no longer escape the honors being thrust upon him. The time of deliverance is at hand, old Rotan said when he awoke. His voice, that so long had been cracked and feeble, was suddenly strong, vibrant, with belief in the visions that had come to him. They were in the inner chamber of the White Mountain, where Dean Rawson, heartsick, lonely, and hopeless, had spent most of his time listening to the voice from the outer world. Gore was there, and Loa, and the writers had left their desks to gather around old Rotan, where now the old servant of the mountain stood erect, his glistening eyes fixed unwaveringly upon Rawson. Listen, he commanded. Rotan speaks the truth. Never shall the people of the light return to the outer world. It is here we stay. For now our world, which is lost, shall be returned to us. His eyes, unnaturally bright, met the wandering gaze of his own people, gathered round, then came back to rest again upon Rawson. Dean, Ra, son, he said. Ra, do you not see? It is our own word. Ra, the messenger, Dean, messenger of the sun. The sun god has sent him. He will set us free. He will restore our lost cities. The people of the light will spread out to fill the new land. They will multiply and once more will be a mighty nation, living happily as of old in their own lost world. Dean, he called. Dean, messenger of the sun. He was drawn to his full, frail height, his arms outstretched. But Rawson saw the old eyes close, sensed the first slackening of that tense body. It was he who sprang and caught the sagging figure in his arms, then lowered the lifeless body to the floor of crystal white. Even happiness can kill. A feeble heart can cease to beat under the stress of emotions too beautiful to be born. And Rotan, wisest of the wise, had passed on to serve his sun god in another world. And thereafter, Rawson, Dean, Ra's son, was undeniably a god. But he wondered, even then, while the others dropped to their knees in humble worship, why Loa, her eyes brimming over with tears, had broken suddenly into uncontrollable sobs and had rushed blindly, swiftly, from the room. To Rawson, the unwavering, simple faith of the White Ones was only an added misery. Rotan's vision was accepted by them unquestioningly. Their adoring eyes followed Rawson wherever he went, while the children carpeted his path to the holy mountain with golden flowers. And there Rawson would sit, cursing silently his own helplessness, while the voice of the mountain told of further devastation up above. His plans for leading a force against the mole men were abandoned. On this island, all that was left of this inner world were only two thousand persons, men, women, and children. And the children were few. The population had been rigorously kept down. Their present number was all that the island would support, though every possible foot of ground was tilled. Only a handful of them, Rawson admitted despondently, and not a weapon of any sort. They've kept by themselves. Only Loa and a few of the others had enough curiosity and nerve to scout around where the mole men live. She even understands their talk. Lord, what I'd give for a thousand like her, a thousand men with her nerve. 
then with weapons and means of transportation. But at that he stopped, aware of the futility of all such thoughts. He tried to talk to Gore, tried to tell him of his own limitations, and Gore had only smiled pleasantly and repeated, Rotan has spoken. It will come to pass. Ceaselessly, his thoughts revolved about the hopelessness of his situation. He was alone. Whatever was to be done, he must do single-handed, and there was nothing he could do. But he would not admit to himself that the aching loneliness came to a focus in the memory of a girl's smiling eyes, the touch of her soft hand. They're fighting up there, he argued, fighting for their lives, and I can't help. What right have I to think of Loa or myself? In spite of which, he sprang abruptly to his feet, left the mountain and the voice of the mountain behind him, and went in search of the girl. I've got to make her understand, he exclaimed. I've got to have someone to talk to. But I can't make her out. She's so confoundedly respectful, acts as if I were a little tin god. And yet, she wasn't always that way. At the home of Gore he found Loa, slim and beautiful as always. She had just come from the bath. The creamy texture of her skin had flushed to rosiness in the cold fountain. Her jeweled breastplates sparkled. A cloth that shone like silk enwrapped her hips in soft folds of pale rose and hung in an absurd little skirt. She might have been the spirit of youth itself, a vision of loveliness. Yet Rawson felt an almost uncontrollable desire to take her in his two hands and shake her when she bowed humbly and treated his request as if it were a royal command. To walk with Dean Rawson? But certainly, if that is his wish. In silence they left the village and walked toward the island's end, where Rawson had emerged from the underworld. The island was not large. On either side were low hills, mere knolls of white crystal, where, in every hollow, Men and women were harvesting strange grain. Between the two ranges of hills were flat fields of green, reaching out toward the point some three miles distant. Rawson made no attempt to talk as he led Loa along the roadway that cleft the green expanse in half. Other workers were there, and Dean acknowledged their smiling, worshipful salutations. He did not want to talk now. He wanted to find some place where he and Loa could be by themselves. There was so much he must tell her. He must try to make her understand. And after that, perhaps, with her help, he could find some way to be evade to his own beleaguered people, something he could do, even single-handed. Where the fields ended, and from there on toward the point, had been an expanse of glistening white. Rawson remembered it plainly. So now, when he found it a place of flaming crimson, he stared in amazement. Across the full width of the valley a brilliant carpet had spread itself, a covering of flowers. A blossoming vine had sprung up in the few days since his arrival, and had woven a thick mat of vegetation. He wanted to go out to the extreme end of the point. There they would be alone. But Loa objected when he started to enter the red expanse. No, she said in quick alarm, we must not cross. It is the place of death. We will go around it following the hills. We crossed it the other day when it was a plain of white salt, argued Rawson. But now the flowers have come. Even now it might be safe. But when they die, then nothing can cross here and live. Loa could not give the reason. Dean gathered from what she could tell that a gas of some sort was formed, perhaps by the decomposing vegetation. Perhaps it combined with a sparkling white shale. But all this was of no consequence compared with his own problems. He did not argue the matter, but followed where Loa led. "'Where is the shell?' he asked, when they stood at last near the open mouth of the great shaft into which the air was rushing. "'Where is the machine that we came here in? I want to see it. Thought perhaps I could use it later on. The jana, the shell as you call it, is safely locked in a great room of Gore's house. Not all understand its use.' It must be kept away from careless hands. Then Rawson put that thought aside. He took Loa's hand and led her some distance away toward the shore. Beyond a rocky, crystalline mass, where fragments had been heaped, the sound of the rushing air was lost. Only the flashing emerald waves whispered softly on the shore beyond. 
And there, in that quiet place, under the brilliance of the central sun, Rawson told her of himself and of the great outer world. He told her of his work, of everything that had happened, of how he was only one of many millions of men and women like, and yet unlike, the people of the light. And at last he knew that she understood. He had spoken softly, though he knew there were no other listening ears. Loa had been seated before him on one of the white blocks. She rose to her feet. Her eyes were troubled. Vaguely he sensed behind them a conflict of emotions. I must think, she said. I must walk by myself for a time. Then I will return. Rawson reached for her hand. You're a good sport, he said huskily. Then he felt the trembling of that hand in his, and, as if it had been an electric current, his own body responded. Shaken in every nerve, his poise deserted him. He could not think clearly. He only knew that that horrible loneliness was somehow gone. By force of will alone, he kept his arms from reaching out toward that radiant figure. Instead, he raised her hand toward his lips. She withdrew it sharply. No, she said. Our wise ones were mistaken. For years they have listened to the mountain. They have written down its words. Slowly they have learned their meaning. A kiss, they said, was a symbol of love in your world. They were mistaken, as was I. Now I will walk alone for a time. Rawson let her go. She seemed hardly looking where she went. Her eyes were downcast. She moved slowly around the sheltering rock and on toward the level ground and the rushing winds of the shaft. His own thoughts were in a whirl, too confused with emotion for clear thinking. A symbol of love. And back there in that cave world, she had pressed her lips to his hand. Then they had come here, and he had been transformed to a god, a being who could never have more than an impersonal affection for one as humble as she. The rising flood of happiness within him was abruptly frozen, changed to something which filled his veins with ice. For, from beyond the crystal barrier that hid Loa from his view, her voice had come in in one single cry of terror. Then, Dean, she called, Dean San. But by then, Rawson was throwing himself madly around the barricade of rocks. Like a sensitized plate, when the camera's shutter is opened a merest fraction of a second, Rawson's brain took the imprint of every detail that was there. The black mouth of the shaft, and on the rock beside it, something metallic, brilliantly gleaming, a flamethrower. Beyond the pit was Loa, half crouching, her slim body tense, as if checked in mid-flight. She had been running toward him, coming to warn him. And between her and the shaft, his back turned squarely toward Rawson, was the hideous figure of a mole-man, one of the reds. His grotesque pointed head was bent forward toward the girl. His arms were reaching, the long fingers like talons. Rawson did not know when he called the girl's name, but he knew the instant that he had done it, and he knew it was a mistake. He should have crept quietly, seized the weapon, and now his feet tore madly on the white rock floor as he raced toward the shining implement of death. From beyond, the red figure, whirling at his call, leaped wildly for the same prize. The taloned hands were on the flamethrower first. Rawson saw the red body straighten, saw the weapon swing, glistening in air, swinging over and down. From its tip, green fire made a straight line of light. He leaped in under the descending flame, felt the nozzle of the projector as it crashed upon his right shoulder, and the green fire spat harmlessly beyond his back. The last spring had thrown him bodily against the red monster. They were both knocked off balance for a moment. Then Rawson caught himself and swung with his left. He set himself in that fraction of a second, felt the first movement of that shining, crook-necked tube that meant the green flame was being drawn back where it could reach him, and then his fist crashed into a yielding jaw. Not five feet from the brink of that nearly bottomless shaft, he stood wavering in the rush of air. He knew that the ugly red figure had toppled sideways, that the weapon had fallen with him, the blast swinging up in a vertical hissing arc. Then man and weapon had dropped silently into the pit. He was alone, save for the girl, who, her eyes wide with horror, threw herself upon him and clung trembling, while she murmured incomprehensible endearments in her own tongue, 
wherein his own name was mingled. Dean, dear, my own Dean San. But the Mole Men. Dean Rawson's mind was aghast with the horror of it. The Mole Men had now found the way. End of chapter 20